everyone and we welcome you once again to Shifting Tides. Today we take you to the Holy Land, the land between Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. This place has been in dispute for thousands of years because of the inhabitants of three main religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And we talk today to Sami Awad, a Palest who runs a non-profit Palestinian organization called the Holy Land Trust. Being a peace activist, one usually takes on the cause which affects their own community and also wants to bring peace within their own setup and their environment and the country. But what if one embraces their enemy and wants to bring peace even with their, within their enemy circles and trying to bridge the gap between the enemy and their own community? That's what Samyawa is all about. Even when he had to pay a big price for being called a traitor. That is Samyawa. We are so, so grateful for having him on our show today. Let's welcome him. Very, very warm welcome to you, Sami. Thank you so much for being a part of Shifting Tides. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be part of this uh, group and this invitation and this initiative. Thank you for initiating it. So thank wonderful you. to have you. So wonderful. And, and people like yourself are the are the reason why shifting tides is happening you know the the fact that you are an agent of change a, a very big change in the society and that's what's needed you know we have to have light bearers and light beings walking the planet earth it's so important Definitely. the world needs many many these days the world needs many and you are you're creating creating a ripple effect sami and that's what matters that's what matters Every drop in the ocean counts. Every drop. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, so Sammy, yours has been quite a challenging ride, really, you know, to, to have someone, a, a peace activist. I mean, usually in commonplace, commonplace terminology, we say, okay, we fight for a cause we believe in and we fight for the people we belong to, usually. And in your case, it's quite the opposite because you fought all your life, even to bring peace in your enemy side. Now, how did that come about? That's a huge turnaround and that's a huge canvas to talk about where peace is concerned. Yeah. So what, what I'd like to start with is to, to ask you as to what was the trigger? What was the turning point of life? for you, which actually opened the road for nonviolence and peace for you? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think uh, there are many points, uh, as we know, that are part of the journey. Yeah. And I'll mention maybe some of the highlight points in my journey and my life. Uh, the first point happened before I was born, way, way before I was born. <laughs> Okay. Uh, in 1948, as many people know, there was a war in this land, yeah. in the land that we call the Holy Land. Yeah. And I come from a Palestinian family, a Palestinian ancestry that goes for many, many, many years, decades and centuries, actually, of living in this land. Yeah. And my father's family lived in Jerusalem at that time. Mm -hmm. My father was nine years old, uh, living with a family that had uh, seven children, including the parents. When the Jewish forces came to the neighborhood uh, where my family was living, uh, as a result of the war, my grandfather was killed. He was shot uh, by a sniper. The children actually buried their father in the courtyard uh, of the house. Uh, a few days later, when the Jewish forces completely took over that neighborhood, they evicted all the non-Jewish families from that area. Mm -hmm. So as Palestinians, Christians, and Muslims, all were kicked out and we became part of the massive refugee population, okay. uh, the Palestinian refugee population, the crisis of the Palestinian refugees that lives until this day. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the turning point for the family was my grandmother. Uh, when we talk about women who are the true visionaries and leaders in society, I fully honor my grandmother as the inspiration for what the family has become. A woman who suffered so much injustice 
the killing of her husband, the losing of her home, uh, everything. The, the only material items she had was one bag full of clothes for her and her seven children. Uh, and for such a woman to commit her life to saying that we will never seek revenge and retaliation for what happened to us as a family. Oh, revenge wow. and retaliation will not get us anywhere, will not bring my husband back and will not bring our uh, property back. And at the same time, she also insisted that we will also proactively seek peace and reconciliation with those who did this to us. Wow. And that was the message, that was the seed that she planted in the family. For her, this is how she even defined justice. Amazing. Justice was achieving ultimate peace and reconciliation with those who have done injustice to us. Absolutely. And so I grew up in a family that, that had those beliefs very strongly in them from, from early ages. Uh, and so that was, I would say, the first turning point. Yeah. Uh, the, the second turning point in my life was... When I was 12, uh, an uncle of mine, one of uh, her sons, uh, became a leader in the Palestinian nonviolent movement. His name is Mubarak Awad. He was actually referred to as the Gandhi of the Middle East uh, at one point. He was fully committed to nonviolence as a means of seeking this peace and reconciliation with, uh, with Israelis. Mm -hmm. And when I was 12 years old, I participated in my first nonviolent demonstration with him that he was leading. Okay. It was a demonstration to plant olive trees in a piece of property owned by a Palestinian farmer that was threatened to be illegally confiscated uh, by the Israelis to build an illegal settlement. Uh, settlements are, are towns, communities for Jews only living on the land. Palestinians can't even live in them. And, and that was a demonstration I went to. And the turning point for me was when I was uh, planting my olive tree, as all of us were doing, Palestinian and Israeli activists, by the way, not just Palestinians, Israeli activists committed to peace with the Palestinians were with us okay. in this protest. An Israeli soldier came and from behind my back reached out and uprooted the tree from the ground and threw it on some stones nearby. And the only thing I was witness to was his shadow because he came from behind me. So I saw the shadow, the, the, even the shadow of the machine gun that he was carrying on his back. And as he did this and his arm, of course, with the green army uniform. And I would say the turning point was the decision at that time to ask, what do I do? And I wasn't like fully conscious of it, but, but the only thing I remember was my uncle saying, you are here to plant your trees. No matter what happens, plant your trees. Wow. And as a 12-year-old child, I could have run away, I could have hidden, I could have cried, I could have been in absolute fear. And I decided, yeah, I'm here to plant the tree. And so as soon as I saw the shadow walk away, I grabbed the tree and put it back in the ground. And that wow. was such, a, like for me, a, a full experience of empowerment. Mm -hmm. And then when I talk about nonviolence, this is what I talk about. Nonviolence is empowerment. It's, it's for me to understand that I have the power, no matter what the other side does, I have the power to decide uh, my future and my fate. Even if I was in prison, like Mandela, I have the power to, to define how I relate to that experience. They don't tell me how I relate to it. And that was a very big turning point that made me commit my life from the age of 12 to nonviolence. Mm. My uncle, at some point a few years later, was actually arrested by the Israeli government because of his nonviolence work, mm -hmm. and he was deported. He was physically kicked out from his ancestral homeland because he was committed to nonviolence. Uh, and that was another turning point in my life where I said, I want to go deeper in understanding why does the Israeli government and military see nonviolence as such a threat? He was even see they, they labeled him a threat to the national security of Israel. Like this is yeah, yeah, a national security of a country threatened by one person committed to nonviolence. Yeah. That's quite a dichotomy, uh, actually, you know? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And and so this is where I committed to go deeper into studying. I studied peace and reconciliation, political science in the US for my graduate degree and came back and started an organization called Holy Land Trust that is fully committed to engaging 
in nonviolence, promoting nonviolent resistance and activism as a key component of our work. Okay. As, as moving in this work, uh, uh, and uh, during that time, there was a peace process known as the Oslo peace process. Mm -hmm. We were excited about it, but this Oslo peace process failed. And at that point, I began to ask questions. Why, why did this peace process really, really fail? Was it just diplomatic lack of negotiations or strategy, or is there something deeper? Mm -hmm. And then for me, the answer came when I was invited to uh, join a retreat called the Bearing Witness Retreat mm -hmm. that is held by the Zen Peacemaker community. And this retreat is held in, uh, in the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergenau. And then I would say that was the last like major turning point in my life mm -hmm. where I began to understand and then to answer your question that I need to understand my enemy deeply. Uh, in, in conflicts, we usually make, make it very, you know, black and white, right and wrong. You know, yeah. we are the oppressed and the oppressor, the occupied and the occupier. And then we, even those who are oppressed, we we find ways to demonize and dehumanize our oppressors and and yes it makes sense because we're experiencing so much violence but but in auschwitz i began to ask the question what is behind what what is behind the the israeli suppression of me as a palestinian is it just yeah. fighting over land is it political and and that's in auschwitz i understood the, the trauma the trauma factor how collective trauma plays such a major role in determining who we are, our identity, yeah. our decisions, and how we identify the other. Yeah. And so for me, it became very important to understand that for real peace to work, healing needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And the healing needs to happen for both the oppressor and the oppressed in, yeah. in times of conflict yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. And that's what they say when, when someone hurts you, instead of getting angry, you you should know that that person is hurting and that's why that person is hurting you that person needs healing as well so exactly so how were you how were you treated when you came back with this call with this decision that you've got to understand your enemy and you've got to heal the enemy as well because it's a collective trauma so how did your people take that because i'm sure it wasn't appreciated by everyone right yeah there was, uh, there was some divide. There was a very big divide between the two communities. Exactly. Yeah, there, there is some acceptance, but the majority of, of Palestinians, uh, we don't deny the Holocaust. We don't uh, negate the Holocaust, but we just don't acknowledge how it plays a role in the current situation. Most people look into the Holocaust as Palestinians and we say, yeah, this is history. This is what happened to them. It's very sad. But now this is the reality. The reality is we are facing oppression. We are facing violence. Yeah. And it's and it's it's very clear and very painful on a daily basis what we experience here. Uh, most Palest Many Palestinians would say we are the victims of the most victimized people. So we acknowledge their victimization, but we are their victims. Yeah. Uh, many Palestinians uh, would say things like they're doing to us what happened to them. So in a sense, we acknowledge what happened to them and we are now suffering. So there isn't a denial of it, but there wasn't any deep understanding and research on how the Holocaust has affected the development of the mindset of the Israeli Jewish community. And I want to say it's not just the Holocaust. It's also many, many, many years, hundreds and thousands of years of Jewish suffering that led the high point being the Holocaust itself, where that identity of yeah. we as Jews are always suffering and therefore we have to protect ourselves no matter what the cost yeah. has manifested itself. Um, and and, and then the challenge for me and for all of us who believe in this work is to create a, a distinction between understanding the trauma of the Jewish people and not using that as a justification to what is happening to us. Because many people will think, yeah, if you understand that somebody is in pain and they're hurting you, that means you're justifying their conduct towards you. And we say, no, there isn't justification. We want to understand because if we can engage in healing, then we can really create a stop for the violence to continue. And there is awareness that where, where their violence is coming from. Because most people who are traumatized 
and who have power who are engaging in violence don't make don't make that connection if it's individual or collective right. and so by creating this thing, distinction we say yes we need to heal the trauma and we stand against the injustice and violence by committing ourselves to non-violent resistance so we continue to resist mm -hmm. the oppression but we do it through non-violence because we believe it is a much better approach a much stronger approach and and it also uh, ends the cycle of violence itself yeah. when you are engaged in nonviolence, and it allows for the space for healing to take place as well mm -hmm. uh, but but it's not easy and then we continue to do what we do uh, we have many people that join our programs for this trauma healing and many people who reject us and call us traitors or normalizers for even engaging uh, with the with the enemy in a way yeah. uh, and Again, I, I, I cannot uh, be condemning people who are deeply emotionally hurt. Mm. Their families have been hurt. People in their families have been killed. Their lands have been confiscated, homes demolished. I mean, somebody told me once, it's like asking a woman who is being raped to understand why the man is raping her. Mm. And I said, it's very, very difficult. And I fully understand this. And then... Uh, Absolutely. it's very it's very difficult mm -hmm. but for me it, it's still very important to understand where that comes from and again it's not about justifying the act we create a difference between the action and the cause of the action and this is the work that we're uh, trying to do here yeah i remember you once uh, mentioned when you came back from auschwitz auschwitz you were taken as a traitor by your own people and your and your office got got turned down or something happened to your office i mean can you narrate yeah. it? how did you come about in 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 bridging that gap and making your people understand you know that there is a bigger purpose here for doing what you yeah need. for for that and many things that we have done because we we decided at that point we want to fully open up to engaging with israelis in the work of healing and transformation and nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of this, our office was attacked uh, by a very small number of Palestinians. They don't represent anything when it comes to the majority, but we were still attacked by uh, Molotov cocktails that were thrown at our office. Uh, thankfully, uh, no major damage uh, happened. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it's, it's again somebody who is committing an act of violence, even towards us. We have to go through the same process of understanding why do they do this act what is the motivation behind it and again what is the trauma and the fear behind it and so we we in a, in a sense we're using the same approach the same formula in 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 listening and addressing those people who are attacking us yeah. because it's at the core it's the same it comes from a place of fear and trauma and defense mechanisms that people are trying to engage in so so this is, I think, where compassion and understanding and empathy plays a very, very important role, even to those who are attacking you from your own people to say, yes, I fully understand, I fully hear you. And of course, for us, it was very important, uh, even when we found out who it was, to try to reach out to them. And, and at least with some, we've had success. Yes, they're not part of our programs, but just because they saw us not pressing charges, not engaging in violence towards them, not judging them, not condemning them. They're like, wow, there is something different about, <laughs> about these people. And I think this is the practice we're all learning to do. When you practice peace, you have to practice it fully. <laughs> you know, it's not just peace with my enemy, it's also peace with my yeah. community as well. So tell me, Sami, um, in, your, in your entire work for towards nonviolence and creating peace, you are majorly focusing on healing people, healing the trauma, healing the collective trauma. So what are the basic, just two or three healing modalities you are you're practicing within your community and as a collective whole, which, which is uh, really helping? I mean, something you may have tried many, many things, but something which is really working um, and healing people inside out what would you recommend yeah. what are you practicing and what would you recommend for others to do yeah so once i set out to to look for different programs and ideas 
it was very difficult. Uh, there, there weren't any local models or experiences dealing in collective trauma healing work yeah. uh, within the Palestinian-Israeli peace movement. A lot of the peace work at that time was dialogue that was focused on finding political solutions and reconciliation on what I would call compromise, compromising negotiations, even in dialogue work that was happening. Yeah. Uh, but I was very lucky to actually get to meet uh, two Israeli organizations that are also very interested in this work as well. Okay. And our collaboration together has been amazing. Uh, the Rossing Center in Jerusalem and Hebrew Union College, where both of them were engaged in developing a deeper understanding of collective trauma healing work. Uh, also uh, connecting with the... Uh, different groups in the United States, in Germany, in South Africa, and learning from uh, experiences and examples uh, in many, many, in Rwanda, for example, you know, the deep healing work that happened there uh, in Rwanda was a very big uh, uh, insight uh, for us. And, and so with, the, with this work, uh, Friends Across Borders, for example, from Germany have done tremendous work with us also, another amazing organization that we work with. Uh, the, the main core of, of the work that we do is based on narrative, okay. understanding narrative. And then one of the tools that we developed is something called the spiritual questionnaire, mm -hmm. which allows an individual to really share uh, openly in a trusting uh, atmosphere and transparently uh, certain aspects of their life and to understand how these personal aspects in their life are actually influenced by the collective identity of their community. Correct. Yeah. So personally, I'm influenced by the collective and the collective, of course, feeds from our personal engagement in it. The collective exists yeah. in the multitude of individuals. Yeah. And there, there is a majority of individuals that are engaging from a traumatic experience in that collective, then that collective identity becomes shaped in that way. So the collective and the personal are completely intertwined with each other. Yes. And so what happens in the process of the spiritual questionnaire, again, in a circle where it is Palestinians and Israelis, that uh, are a safe container where they are really able to share their stories and their narrative of how the collective have influenced their personal and how their personal mm -hmm. has affected the collective. This is where the healing actually begins to happen. Yeah. I mean, we, we cannot say there is, you know, healing, like, you know, the, the ultimate healing experience uh, that we all hope for. But the moment I just begin to understand that I am motivated by trauma, in my collective and personal decision making, mm -hmm. then I have access to choice. Yeah. Uh, and to understand that, you know, our traumatic experiences are ones that come from the past. And so again, the distinction is to understand, like, the, again, practice of mindfulness and practice of awareness is to understand that, wow, okay, I'm ready to, to make a decision now. Where does this decision come from? Mm -hmm. Is it coming from a place of pain, from a place of trauma, from a place of the past? or from a future that I want to create independent from that past. Yeah. And this is, this is again, the, the deep work that we are engaging in. And it's very, very strong and very profound. And, and people's life are transformed uh, by these experiences. So, in fact, in, yeah, go on, yeah. Go, on, go on, go on. So, so yeah, what, what we want to continue to aim for and target is, is people of influence, like you said in the beginning, people of influence that can influence others in their speech. Yeah. So when political leaders, social leaders, religious leaders, heads of women's organizations begin to speak to their audience or to their followers from a place that is healed in terms of the, uh, the narrative that is spoken, yeah. then that affects the community itself. Fear is very, very easy to use as a tool to motivate people. We know this. You, you, you know. Actually, there's a saying that says, "Fear is the greatest motivator of human behavior." It's, it's and 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 this is what we understand. This and this is why we see around the world now the, the the politicians that are in power are mostly ones that have used fear to gain power by by making them afraid of other communities, by making them afraid of other races, by making them afraid of immigrants, by making their community afraid of 
other religions, this is how they gain power. They have nothing to offer their communities but fear and saying that we have the answers to your fear, yeah. which is violent usually. Yeah. And, and so this is the hard work. Uh, we're trying to do this work as much as possible locally, but we understand that this is, fear is a, we, we talk about pandemics that we're facing. I would say fear is the greatest pandemic that we face as human beings. Totally. And, and we need to really deeply uh, address this. Yeah. It's a long process. And I cannot say that we have tremendous successes here, but we believe that the work we're doing in the small steps we're taking are the way to move forward. Mm -hmm. Sami, when you started, the first, the first uh, turning point which you shared, I mean, the second one, when you turned, when you were 12 and you were planting your trees, starting from there to now, it's been a very, very long journey for you, including studying and educating yourself in the pre uh, conflict resolution and peace building and studying political science and then coming and implementing all those things in your land within your in your in your mind and within your experience what would you say how would you quantify if you had to how much success do you see in your environment within your circle what kind of a shift do you see you, there's been in the people in your community, in your country? Yeah. I mean, first, I want to say I wish we had the resources to be able to implement these programs at a much bigger scale than what we're doing now. Yeah. Uh, so we're very, very limited with the resources uh, that we have uh, available to us. Uh, but this said, uh, what I can say honestly is that it's maybe not... Uh, quantitative, but qualitatively, the, the level of transformation that I have seen in the people that have taken our courses is tremendous. It mm -hmm. changes people's lives. Yeah. And then this is something that I really, you know, uh, as, as you said, I've been practicing this work uh, since I was 12. I've been in so many workshops, so many trainings, so many seminars, read so many books on conflict resolution, uh, conflict management, negotiations, dialogue, you name it, I've, I've been in it. And, and I look back and in my experience, you know, I've been running an organization for 25 years now. And I look back at the times before we started this uh, healing trauma component of the work and after and when I look before, I say, yes, we did a lot of work. We did a lot of trainings. We did a lot of seminars, a lot of workshops. But most of these, as, as beautiful as they are, most of these uh, programs that are being implemented by many organizations are more, they, they stick into the cognitive aspect of our mind. It's, it's, uh, it becomes an exercise of, of the mind, talking, negotiating, learning some skills, getting to know somebody. Yes, it makes it again, I'm not, uh, I don't want to be a, a deep critic of this work, but to understand that there is a deeper level, which is the emotional somatic level that, that, that most of this work hasn't gone into. Mm. Uh, and this is the healing work. This is, this is the, the deep emotional work because I can experience a beautiful seminar with Palestinians and Israelis. I leave the seminar and I'm stopped at a checkpoint and I'm beaten up by Israeli soldiers what happens then everything i've done in the seminar goes up in the air because now look at me and what happened to me this is why the deep transformation and healing work uh, becomes very very important and and we're seeing this yeah. we're seeing this happen with the people that have taken uh, our programs palestinians and israelis are like that something shifts in again it's an identity issue like something shifts in me that makes me become a different person. And it's, again, not an easy process. No, and, and our programs are very intensive and they take a long time. This is not just, you know, come for a three-day workshop and all of a sudden you experience healing. It's a very de delicate and very intensive program with a lot of follow-up that we engage in uh, with our communities. Uh, yeah, so for me, I would say... Yes, we need, we need all the programs, including the ones that really allow for depth work to happen. Mm -hmm. That I would say, sadly, most funders are not really interested in to fund mm -hmm. these programs. Yeah. Most, most funders are looking for you know, the quantity. How many people did you train in a year? Yeah. 
and we'll fund, you know, you say a thousand people, oh, wow, this is good, then we'll fund you. But you say 15 people, like, it's not worth uh, our funding. <laughs> uh, but but we believe, we believe in this work. And I think for me, I, the reason I believe in it is because we are, we have been part of this journey mm. of researching and discovery. We allow ourselves to never reach the point where we say, this is it there you know this is this is the way things need to happen for me it's a, a continuous journey of deeply asking the question what can we do what can we learn what can we change what can we bring into our communities what are other communities experiencing yeah. uh, so we live a, as a laboratory of always researching uh, methodologies and approaches uh, for peacemaking yeah yeah in your entire uh, experience, I mean, you seem to have devoted your entire life to this cause. And I'm sure you must have really come across some heartwarming stories, heart-wrenching stories, you know, because these are human stories and you are experiencing that on a daily basis. So uh, can you recall any one or two such stories which, which touched your life profoundly? Hmm. Well, we think of which ones to share with you. <laughs> the first one coming to my mind is in one of the seminars we were holding, there was an Israeli woman and then the, and she came fully proud of coming from a very right wing political group, not settlers, but a very right wing uh, group. And then her participating in the seminar was just to see what this was about and to actually challenge. Okay. <laughs> and then that first, I have to say, I was a little bit uh, taken back and, and challenged by the Israeli uh, organizers who invited her. Uh, but she is a woman of influence and they said it's very important for her to be, to be in this. And, and this is a woman that was uh, born... Uh, in the so she's an elder woman like in the maybe in the early 50s okay. and and what she experienced when she connected the personal and the collective traumas together what she was experiencing in her life growing up was the same experiences of the journey of the nation of israel as it was being born and emerging as well uh, one profound moment that changed her life, for example, was how uh, she felt uh, as a child growing up in a, in a male-dominated family, how she was rejected by her brothers mm -hmm. and how her brothers always put her on the side, always fought her. And the only way that she can prove herself was to actually become more powerful and more dominating on her brothers and suppressing them and manipulating them to gain her voice, to gain her power, to be able to be established. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she was saying this, immediately it clicked in her mind and her story how, wow, you know, as Israel, we established ourselves and we were rejected by our Arab neighbors and brothers, you know, the, the family of the Middle East. And to prove our legitimacy to be here as Israel, we had to become even more powerful and more suppressing of the Arabs in order to prove our legitimacy as a nation yeah. to exist. Yeah. And so we suppressed them like I suppressed my brothers so that I can be recognized uh, in my legitimacy to be here. And, and she just connected different parts of history of the state wow. with her to the point where she acknowledged her being right-wing and so radical and extreme in her right-wing views came from a very deep family experience of trauma that she faced as a young woman in her family. And this is the story of her nation as well. Mm -hmm. And that that's it. Like, you know, you can't have this in a dialogue session. <laughs> you, no. you have to go, you have to go deep uh, in this work. You've got and so this is yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is an example that really comes to me and uh, many, many experiences. I think the work that we're doing at one point has touched the life of every person that has taken them. Something has deeply transformed in them. I would say, again, connecting with women, the experience of, of abuse uh, by women, especially sexual abuse by women, Palestinian and Israeli women, 
and again, how that shapes their understanding of the collective and how that shapes their understanding of the politics. And just to make that connection, as I said, is enough. Yes, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, a psychotherapy healing uh, center. This is not the work we do. It's just connecting the narratives together. And for these women to share their deep pain, they're, they're opening up to, to people and men in their circles that they don't even know. And, and they're allowing themselves to be so vulnerable in this that not even that's those who are listening big, to them that's a very are transformed to do yeah, that. by the experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. So quite profound, quite profound. Absolutely. And Sammy, how do you how do you draw a balance? Because you obviously everything you do, you bring home, right? You bring home with yourself and you bring home to yourself as well. So uh, how how do you balance? Because I'm sure in one way, what, what work you're doing is also playing a catalyst for your own transformation, your personal transformation and your personal healing. But to be in a balanced state all the time is very difficult because you're also bringing people's sad experiences and their stories and their uh, traumas and how they have managed to heal or are in the process of healing. It's a big one to carry all the time in your heart. So how, yeah. do, you, how do you create a balance? Because um, why I'm saying that is because in my own personal journey as a filmmaker, I, I tend to be driven or attracted towards films that challenge me. And, and not only just challenge me, also find answers to very pertinent questions. So I bring home that. But there are some films which I worked on, which completely make me dysfunctional after the film is over. Because I'm emotionally so sucked into it. And I have invested so much of me into that, then I don't have the energy after that to function anymore for some time, for a long time. So you need to put yourself back together. How do you do that? You know? Yeah, <laughs> thank you for asking this because it's a very big discussion that we have with the facilitators we work with as well. Uh, there's a beautiful facilitator who's a woman who joins me in a lot of these programs that we do. And, and she says, after every three days of holding these spaces and doing the spiritual questionnaire and going deep, she actually goes into one week of deep pain and depression almost uh, and for her to be able, yeah, and a need for rest in order to, to heal and then to be able to come back to life again. Absolutely. So it's a lot, a lot that we carry. Uh, for me, yeah, I mean, I carry it with me and I, I think a big part of it is just a, a deep practice of meditation and mindfulness and resting becomes very important. Uh, so for me, yes, I, I would spend the whole day after uh, just reflecting, going back, uh, and, and just being in the practice of mindfulness uh, and, and doing deep meditation work, connecting with nature, going outside, connecting with trees, connecting with the earth, mm -hmm. releasing all of this energy back into her, into our mother that holds everything as well, becomes a key practice uh, as well. And, and I would say, for me, one, one way of dealing with this is actually being in the joy of witnessing these transformations happen. Mm -hmm. And so there is the pain that is carried, but there is also the joy of, uh, of seeing people transformed in these spaces and experiences that just gives me energy to want to continue this more and more and more. I can imagine. It's very gratifying. It must be so gratifying. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. But at the same time, very humbling as well, because the work that we do can easily go into the ego and then you become sort of the, the one that has the answers. As I said before, we want to be humble and continuously learning. And we're always learning new things and new tools uh, to bring into this community, learning from indigenous wisdom, learning from traditions from different parts of the world. Uh, learning more about gender issues and the violence that exists between genders as a political issue as well to bring it in because again many times we think of gender violence as the personal experiences but this is collective you know the, the fact that there are so many women around the world 
the experience on a daily basis so much pain mm -hmm. by men that supposedly love them <laughs> uh you know 52 percent of women killed around the world i think according to some statistics are killed in in kind of what we define as as relationship uh, issues it's a political issue it's a political conflict that fully affects us how we grow up mm -hmm. And, and how we perceive gender affects us also how we see politics, how we see possession, control, manipulation, fear in relationships. All of these personal experiences, again, are manifested politically as well. So for me, I think I'm, I'm honored by just having so many people around me that teach me and guide me and help me learn more and more uh, these skills and trust me in, in, in using their methodologies and approaches to bring a healing and peace as much as possible into this land. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, Sami, what faith were you raised in? Because the Holy Land is comprises of three main faiths, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. So which faith were you brought up in? And how so did I was, that influence what you're doing today? So I was brought up in the Christian uh, faith. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I, I think it had a very big part in influencing me, not to be honest, not as the faith, but the way my family practiced that faith. Okay. Because sadly, uh, yeah, I think Christianity is, is one of the most violent religions out there today, even though we might deny it. Mm -hmm. But there's so much violence that happened on the hands of people who alleged to be followers of the teachings of Jesus and call themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, so my grandmother, who was a woman of faith, uh, as I said before, taught her children to seek peace and reconciliation, uh, to love the enemy. Uh, these are the core teachings of Jesus that yeah. I think very, very few Christians live and they are core teachings. Yeah. And so I grew up in that, that faith. Uh, but as I said, I was also very much influenced by other traditions and other religions and uh, other experiences. And, and for me, just opening my heart to everything that is positive that comes from these traditions has has had a big part influence on me. When I when I uh, started practicing meditation and uh, Zen Buddhism as a practice, uh, I actually went to one of the Christian leaders who was uh, guiding me, mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you know, am I wrong in practicing this and being a, a Christian? He's like. Wow, Sam, I practice Buddhism and Zen every day as part of my practice. And he's a pastor, a Christian pastor. So, okay, okay. yeah, I, I think when we, when we, again, exclude others and we begin to say that our thing is the only thing and the right thing, this is just a formula of violence. And, and for me, opening up to all these traditions has, has really helped me grow and develop and, and heal in my own way as well in fact, in fact the situation the place where you're placed where you where you are that probably has played a very big role in making you more secular and also embracing other traditions and religions you know yeah it's, fully fully yeah. yeah yeah if i was living in, in the united states i definitely wouldn't be exactly. <laughs> or anywhere else i wouldn't be this Absolutely. so because you are yeah. interacting with people of different faiths all the time, you know, you're amidst so many other faiths and that makes your heart and heart expand and open and your mind open to receiving and learning so much, so much more. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think what many people in, in the West have, have lost touch is the, uh, the gift of suffering itself as a means of growth. And, and it's not about, yes, creating situations for suffering. But people who go through deep pain and suffering have the possibility of being the most enlightened, the most aware, the most healed, and the most peaceful people aware because they know the experience of what suffering is. And I think this is also very deep in Buddhist tradition as well, like yeah. a, a major principle as well in many, many traditions as well that they see, you know, we, we've, we try to, to suppress suffering and hide away from it, and but it's there. And then when it comes out, we don't know how to deal with it. We just go into the fight and flight mode or the freezing mode, you know, the three Fs. And to find a way to embrace it, to embrace suffering, to embrace grief, and to go through that process personally and collectively to understand it is there. Yeah. And, and there is enlightenment that also comes from that work as well. Yeah. 
uh, for me, it's a gift for all of us to to say that, like, yeah, we could we could be in it and we could grow out of it uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And also in in areas in countries, which is what I have observed in my within my uh, profession, the the countries which are really troubled are the conflict zones. The best and the most sensitive creative work comes out of there. Most because yeah. Because the films or the art or whatever comes out of there comes out of their own experiences, their own deep personal experiences, which are exactly. so, which are full of so much of um, grief and sadness. Because from there emerges the learning, from there emerges the transformation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, because yeah. I love Iranian films and I love films from Afghanistan. I love those films. They are so real. They are so human. You know, yeah. So, um, you know, in the news, um, in the news, we always get get information about Israel and Palestine. And I think I I'm talking from my personal knowing. Uh, I've always got a very lopsided view of that part of the world. You know, so you you hear only of the, the conflicts that are going on, the political situation and how how people are suffering and how people have fought over the, the history. So really something new doesn't come very often other than news on conflicts. Yeah. But you being from there, can you throw some light or just give us a peek into what is it like living there? Because you are living in a beautiful place where the one of the most sacred sites of three religions are there. So it must be so beautiful. It's like a, uh, it must be like a vortex, a very powerful vortex to live in. So, it's it's the dichotomy of, of everything here. Absolutely. Yeah. So can you give exactly. us a peek into what is it like living in that beautiful land? And, um, you know, you're living in the, in the, in the womb of God. <laughs> you know, yeah. This is what I would see. Yeah. So if you can give us give a little peek, that would be wonderful. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, this this land is very beautiful and the and the the nature is beautiful and the connection to the land is very beautiful and and the depth of history of this land is very, very beautiful. And at the same time, there is the whole history, as I said, the dichotomy of this land has also experienced so much violence and so much wars and so much bloodshed. This, it's not just the Palestinian Israeli. It's for over 2,000 years, 3,000, 4,000 years that this land has been fought for and fought over yeah. by different people to take control and to take over. And so the, the reality that we live in as Palestinians is also a very challenging and difficult reality. My my freedom doesn't exist uh, on a personal level, on a collective level as Palestinians. My movement is limited. My access to resources is limited by the Israeli occupation. I don't have access to water, for example, at the same level that the Israeli has. They have 10 times more access to water than I do have access to water uh, or land or resources. Uh, uh, in Bethlehem, where I live, for example, it's very, very challenging because we are completely, like many other Palestinian cities, surrounded by walls and fences and Israeli settlements. We, we don't even have land and room to expand anymore. I don't even know how life will function in a city in like Bethlehem 20 years from now if the situation continues at as, as it is with the population growing and no room to, to expand. It, it'll become uh, more and more challenging. And of course, we cannot even ignore even the more difficult situation of our uh, families uh, in Gaza, the Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip that you hear about, that their life is even more difficult and challenging. My mother's family lives in Gaza, mm -hmm. getting electricity three hours a day. Imagine, imagine that. And sometimes Gaza on the coast, very hot in the summer. Uh, we just had uh, a very big snow and rainstorm coming and most of Gaza is flooded. Uh, homes are being flooded there. So we cannot deny that uh, the injustice that is happening. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and I fully acknowledge and agree with you, we cannot just look at that and say, this is it. 
because that can only bring us hopelessness around the world when they say, oh, this is the situation. You know, most people, when they look into the Palestinian-Israeli situation, they say, oh, but it's been going on for so long. Some even people connected to biblically, biblical times that we've, how can I be involved in peacemaking in a, in a place that they've been living in conflict for thousands of years? Yeah. So most people will ignore uh, ignore this because it becomes something impossible to engage in. Mm. But this is where, you know, these beacons of light and hope, the work that we're doing and the work that many, many others are doing become a beacon of light and hope for the people here. Yeah. And, and, and there is something happening. Like, uh, I'm not, I don't want to claim any credit for it. There is something that is shifting also in the mindset of many Israelis and many Palestinians that are really getting tired of this reality we're living in and tired of 25 years of negotiations that have led to nowhere except worsening the situations. And there are voices that are coming out. And I would say the two main groups that are, are leading this voice to say enough is enough. We need really something new. One is women on both sides, that the voice of women is beginning to emerge from this uh, system of male domination and uh, patriarchal system that are saying we need our voice heard. And the youth, uh, the young generation that is saying also, you know, what, where is our future? What is going to happen to us? And so more of these circles of Palestinian Israelis coming together that are going into deep healing work are coming together, uh, that are going into really understanding how ideologies have been so violent in how they have shaped our mindset. Mm -hmm. If it's nationalism, Zionism, religious uh, intolerance of others. So there is emergence of something happening in this land uh, that, yeah. that, that I think is very, very special as well. And like you said, uh, the media will almost never uh, talk about it no, because it's, it's not a hot topic as, as violence and uh, war is. Yeah. Yeah. Confrontation and sensationalism is the heart throb of media. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, yes. All, that's all how media thrives, you know, and, and one of the reasons why shifting tides is happening is just to just to make people feel good it's like feel good because in in such times you are so tired of watching uh negativity on media all the time you want to feel good in your heart you want to feel expansive in your heart you want to feel you know love and that inspires you yeah that inspires exactly. you totally. to do something to do something yeah if everything was gloomy, then I wouldn't want to do anything. But if I begin to see somebody doing something, I get inspired and I want to do this. And then I want to do this. And this is the work you're doing, which I honor. Okay. Connecting all of these people together and, and showing the world that, yes, there, there is a different possibility out there. And, and people even, are engaged. Yeah, absolutely. Because every drop counts. Every drop counts. You know, Even if you, if you impact one life in your entire lifetime, if you impact one life, you've done God's work. You exactly work, you know and that's that's yeah. what matters and we trust we trust everything we're doing like you said is planting seeds you know peace might not happen in my lifetime but i know that the next generations are going to carry this much deeper than what i have done and the next generation and someday yeah uh, something will something big will happen here my my hope is that you know this place that has been seen as the darkest place in the world will one day become seen as the light to the world and when will shine this light and becomes a model it what sure real peace will look it like sure what will. it's got peace. all the ingredients it sure will it's yeah. got all the ingredients i would love That's to no come there <laughs> i would love Yella. to we would love to welcome you here for sure <laughs> thank you thank you sami with that note i think um, more power to you, Sami. More power to you, really. To all of us, to all of us. Thank you for the work you're doing. Really, deeply, deeply appreciate you and everything you're doing as well. Thank you. Lovely, lovely yeah. having you over. And what a delightful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless. Bye-bye. Talking to Sami today was so enlightening and so heartwarming. Because what it really brought to me was that the key to good life, the key to happiness is actually 
to live beyond oneself, to be able to give every bit of yourself for the sake of the other. And that's what Sami is all about. More power to him. Live with this in your heart for some time because I'm speechless. I really don't have much words to say because I'm so filled with gratitude for having him over on our show today and to bring him to your screens. So stay with this in your heart and let's send out collectively best wishes his way so that his dream comes true of being making that land a land of light. And with that, we end today's episode and we will see you soon with yet another story very soon. Goodbye for now. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Shifting Tides. Only with your continued enthusiasm and support, we have managed to journey so far. If you feel pulled into supporting us, please feel free to donate on the link below. Thank you so much. Thank you.